pleased to be here today with Professor Matthias Beller of the Leibniz Institute for Catalysis, LICAT, at the University of Rostock, Germany, the winner of the 2016 ACS Catalysis Lectureship for the Advancement of Catalytic Science. The lectureship is an award recognizing the contributions of one individual or a collaborative team for groundbreaking research that has a profound impact on catalysis, jointly sponsored by the journal ACS Catalysis and the ACS Division of Catalysis Science and Technology. Matthias is being recognized for his contributions to the resurgence in catalysis with iron, as well as the amazing breadth of his numerous contributions in molecular catalysis. Congratulations, Matthias, on being selected as the winner of the 2016 ACS Catalysis Lectureship. Thank you very much, Chris. I, I really feel honored uh, to be selected. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the selection committee, uh, the people involved in, in that, uh, but uh, apart from being happy about this prize, I feel a little bit embarrassed because, as you know, science in, in general is, is a group effort and uh, this prize is only possible because of the work of a dedicated group of people and I'm especially thankful to my co-workers and uh, the students and they really made this prize possible. I'd like to begin with your earliest experiences in chemistry. What drew you to the field? Was there a particular person or experience that drove you to devote your career to chemistry? Yeah, so I'm the first person in uh, my family who studied natural sciences. And so th there is not really a history of natural scientists in our family. And my father has a small had a small business. And um, so I was really attracted by a school teacher to chemistry. And uh, this was probably at the seventh grade. Um, when I realized that a lot of the things which happen around us, are, they are all based on chemistry. And I found it particularly intriguing how these small molecules uh, control our world or made our, make our world. And uh, because of that, I was really, uh, I, I really liked the subject. I looked more deeply into that. Initially, I thought of becoming a chemistry teacher. But uh, finally, I decided to, to go into chemistry. Um, and nowadays, I believe when I talk to children, my own children, but also smaller children in school or so, I, I believe we should teach science on an earlier level. Because a lot of these children are very much attracted already at elementary school on scientific questions. And um, science is necessary to solve the problems of our society today, and we need more good scientists. The study of catalysis has been a cornerstone of chemistry for over a century. What drew you to catalysis science, and why has catalysis become such an important part of your research program? Yeah, catalysis is a key technology for enabling synthetic transformations. This, this is a topic which is of a lot of interest to me today. But during my studies, I was, I would say, more attracted by biochemistry, um, medical sciences. And um, I was very close, actually, to, to do a master, which is obligatory in Germany, uh, to do a master in, in, in biochemistry, nucleic acid chemistry. But then I, I decided to combine synthetic organic chemistry with applications in medical sciences. So I, choose the, uh, I, I joined a group of uh, Lutz Tietze at the University of Göttingen, and I did my master on models for anti, for, for anti tumor and antiviral prodrugs based on carbohydrates. I continued with that subject in, uh, during my PhD, and I got more involved in catalysis after uh, moving to Boston uh, to work with Barry Sharpless. There I got first time involved in oxidation catalysis. But finally, the real catalysis uh, I experienced in industry. And from that time on, I'm really uh, fascinated by the possibilities, unlimited possibilities of catalysis. Matthias, your career has progressed in several stages, beginning with your work in industry at Herxt. Can you comment on how your experience working in industry prepared you for your academic research career and, and how it shaped the types of questions or problems in which you choose to engage? So after doing postdoctoral work with Barry, I was, I was not really sure if I should continue my career in academia or if I should go to industry. And I talked to some people 
on the academic side, um, but at the same time, I did some interviews with, with industry. And um, that was around 1990. And at that time, the large international chemical companies, they still had significant um, central research sites. And I was very much attracted, or, by, by, or I, I found an offer from Hoechst AG, which was at that time among the three top chemical companies in the world, an integrated chemical company. I was very much attracted by their central research site in Frankfurt. And what I saw there was that you can also do in, in industry some interesting basic research. It was a little bit like uh, probably the central station in Wilmington here in, in the US with DuPont. Uh, nowadays, of course, this has changed a lot. Not personally, I believe, not to the better, <laughs> but that's a different question. Um, so, when I started in industry, I realized that often in academia, uh, researchers solve in a very elegant manner non-existent problems. That's a, a friend of mine said it uh, said it uh, some time ago in that way. And I believe it's true, uh, because often there is not enough interaction between industry and academia. Um, our funding does not promote often this interaction. In fact, sometimes uh, it, it prohibits even uh, interaction or makes it more difficult if we think about the problems with IP and all these things. So um, often, Academic researchers work on methodology, technology platforms, and they like to apply them then in, in for various problems, but they do not really know which of the problems are the most interesting ones. Industry, on the other hand, I call it, they were question-driven. They normally, at least nowadays, they don't create any more technology platforms. They are very short-term minded. and. Um, they want to make a specific molecule. They want to improve a specific process or so. And they are only interested in, 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 in that case. And what we try to do in our research institute, which belongs to one of the um, German national sciences, is to, to build a bridge between these, two, this, uh, between these two areas. And contrary to a, to a university, we have some sort of mission statement that each year we would like to bring in at least two processes from lab scale to an industrial pilot plant scale. And you can only do that if you closely cooperate with industry. And such cooperation is not only about the money. Of course, it's nice to get the money. But the real interesting thing is, is the interaction on a similar level. Because of that, actually, you get a lot of inspiration. You, you, you get also knowledge on, on the academic side. And I think this cooperation really influences our research uh, to a significant extent. After your period in industry, you spent some time at the Technical University of Munich before taking on the leadership of the then new Leibniz Institute for Catalysis at the University of Rostock. Over this period, your work has evolved from being initially associated with palatocycles to now covering a huge array of topics in both homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysis. What research problems excite you the most today? That's a difficult one. So. Um, because I'm interested, because I think chemistry as a science has offers so many possibilities and has still so many interesting questions to be answered, it's the most difficult thing is to choose the ones which which are most attractive uh, to yourself. And I'm very much attracted at working at this interface between basic science and application. At the same time, I like to work on some very fundamental basic problems, like uh, how can we, for example, tune non-noble metals to act like noble metals? How can, what are the fundamental differences between a molecularly defined catalytic species and the catalytically active center on a surface? And uh, these questions, I, I um, these questions in, in the environment I'm working now, we can, we can look at these type of questions. Matthias, in your years working in catalysis, what is the biggest surprise you've come across? Was there a particular result or discovery that initially perplexed and excited you? Again, this is an, 
this this is from this is difficult for me to answer um, because I personally believe in science in general proceeds by surprises. Uh, of course, we all write grants and we propose a certain rational uh, direction for solving our problems. But the most interesting things which I experience in science always happen by surprise. Because if it really would go that direct route which you, which you Im initially imagine, I think somebody else would probably have discovered it already. Or it's very close to already known things, so, so it's clever me too or close me too. And so um, throughout my career, my group, I have to say, came across several surprises. Um, one of the more recent ones is the discovery that you can use that, that it's not important if you use a heterogeneous or a homogeneous catalyst for certain reactions. You can use them in the same way, under the same conditions, with same kind of selectivity, if what I call the microenvironment of the catalyst, catalytic center, probably with some added ligand or a specific surface, if you have a heterogeneous material, if they are working in a similar way or in the same way. And Therefore, we discovered, or in this, in this respect, we discovered, for example, ion-based systems, nano-ion oxides, for example, which behave like the ion PNP complexes I mentioned before. Uh, that was really surprising that you have a heterogeneous ion oxide, which is nothing else than a specific rust, works in a similar way like, let's say, the active center of a hydrogenase, if you tune it appropriately. Another thing, uh, an, an, an older surprise, I would say, which made its way into industry was the discovery of a specific class of ligands. I, I always liked this. So back in the end of the 90s, we had the idea instead of, we, we were very much into coupling chemistry still at that time, and we had the idea instead of using triterzbutylphosphine, which was first used by industrial chemists at Toso, then Greg Fu did this beautiful work um, with, with the ligand in various coupling reactions. And we were inspired by that, and we had the idea using triadamantyl, trisadamantyl phosphine, which until recently was not available um, uh, to use that, because we thought it's more stable. And we tried to synthesize it at that time, and we found a way, relatively simple way, from adamantane phosphorus triclide to make di adamantyl alkyl phosphines. And we developed these ligands for various coupling reactions. We used them nicely. In, and after two years or three years after we had the ligands, industry came to us and said, we have a certain problem. And it was a surprise that these relatively new ligands, they work best for that. And then these ligands made their way into industry, and they were used in the first palladium catalyzed reductive carbonylation. This was very pleasing to see how, how it was really applied in industry. For the 2016 Lectureship Award, you were specifically cited for your work on iron catalysis. In late 2015, one of your nominators remarked that you had well over 100 publications on catalysis with iron, including over 30 different reactions. This work ranges from reactions of bulk chemicals, such as formic acid, to smaller scale reactions, including an array of different reduction reactions. Tell me about some of your favorite discoveries in this area. I was surprised that we did so many reactions with ion pers <laughs> I, I have to say. It's, uh, I didn't realize that. But it shows a little bit that um, we are interested in, in various synthetic transformations. And uh, so among the most interesting, I personally believe, was the discovery of the ion PP3 uh, complex catalyzed hydrogenation of carbon dioxide, dehydrogenation of formic acid. This was the first time that we showed that a non-noble metal phosphine complex or molecularly defined ion complex could be as efficient in hydrogenation, dehydrogenation reactions as, as noble metal systems. And I think this, la this was an important basis for a lot of the work afterwards. At the moment, the development of cooperatively working 
Ion Catalyst attracts me most, and therefore there I like the um, the um, complexes with so-called non-innocent ligands, where the ligand really takes part in in the catalysis. And I think this is this is. Uh, a very general principle for catalysis, not only for homogeneous catalysis, but also for heterogeneous catalysis. Often in the molecular world, people think catalysts like the famous Wilkinson catalyst, they are the rule. You have a metal center, and all the individual catalytic steps take place at this one metal center. Oxidative coordination, oxidative insertion, um, reductive elimination, and, and so on. But I think this is more the exception rather than the rule. In biochemistry, enzymes, in heterogeneous catalysis, we always have this phenomenon of cooperativity. So there is several things working together in a catalytic system which lower the activation barrier of the rate determining step and thereby making the overall process better. And in this sense, the ion PNP systems where the nitrogen ion bond cooperatively works together, I think is a very interesting case. And this allowed for the first time, we synthesized the first aliphatic ion PNP complex. And remarkably, at this single ion center, you can activate hydrogen at room temperature and one bar of hydrogen. So it's very similar to the hydrogenases, but it's a single ion center. It's not a complicated enzyme. And you can follow by spectroscopy this activation, deactivation. And we use this then for various hydrogenation, dehydrogenation reactions. Matthias, thank you for sharing your thoughts and experiences in ca catalytic science with the chemical community. Both the ACS Division of Catalysis Science and Technology and the journal ACS Catalysis are excited to honor you as the 2016 winner of the ACS Catalysis Lectureship for the Advancement of Catalytic Science. I look forward to the symposium to be held in your honor at the ACS meeting this fall in Washington, D.C. I also know there is still much to come from your laboratory, and I and the rest of the community eagerly anticipate hearing about your current and future work. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Professor.